Good morning, meine Freunde. It seems almost a rite of passage when one hosts a blog such as this, even one as humble as mine, to prepare a presentation on the 20 best, 10 best album covers of all time. And from the research that I did on the weekend, it appears there's a, a certain cluster of album covers that reappear in different people's assessment in various combinations. Now, there's nothing wrong with this. These might simply be axiomatically great works of art. But it also occurred to me that there were many outstanding designs that never appear on those lists. So that's what today's presentation is about. Now, I won't be saying much from here on in. This is more a feast for the eyes. But no matter how you see it or how you respond to it, I do hope you appreciate an attempt to do something frequently done a little bit differently. It would be very easy to fill this list with covers from the Blue Note, Commodore, Clef or Verb labels, but Atlantic and Columbia all did elegant and innovative work in the late 50s and early 1960s. Expect to see quite a few Herbie Hancock covers here, both for Blue Note and CBS. Satan is Real has a very interesting story behind its album cover. The art direction team, such as it was, literally doused a pile of tyres in petrol, stuck the wooden devil on a stick in the middle of it, set it alight and walked the boys in front of it. They had one shot to get the cover. The smoke from the tyres had already blackened the back of their jackets and trousers. One of the most powerful properties of Highway 61 Revisitors album cover is the way that your eye is drawn from old Bobbo in the foreground to Bob Neweth, the chap with the camera, in the background. The most notable Blue Note albums, such as Cecil Taylor's Unit Structures, were photographed by Francis Wolfe and designed by Reed Miles. Miles' use of dramatic straight lines, serif fonts, and cool minimalism set Blue Note apart for 10 years before Bob Cato revolutionized the album cover at Columbia. Robert Mapplethorpe's cover for Horses is one of the most potent and beautifully evocative photos in all of rock and roll. Saying that, nothing says rock music to me like the cover of Blonde on Bond. Here we have Kraftwerk displaying that famous German sense of humour. The sense of proportion, the impeccable colour grading and the sheer modernity of the Road Song album cover makes it in my opinion one of the finest ever. Wait a minute, where have we seen that Beethoven Piano Concerto album cover before? The James Place album Living on Superstition 
shows that even in the digital age, thoughtful artwork still has a place in enriching the whole product and experience. The design for Sign of the Times in the centre was made up from the set of the production of Guys and Dolls which had closed in Minneapolis and was pretty much rescued from a dumpster. While the Hayley Kyoko album Expectations in the centre was no great shakes to listen to, generic nerdy geek girl waffling, the cover was at least interesting. The sense of movement and dynamism in Desmond Decker's album cover is palpable. Emmy Lou Harris on the right, her Blue Kentucky Girl album cover is an incredibly effective juxtaposition of the very real Emmy Lou in the painted backdrop and the animation of the images and the stoic stillness of the poised and posed Emmy Lou. I'm not sure what Dr. Ali Mantado is trying to say with his album cover on the right, but I suspect the subject is not having a good day. T-Rex's Electric Warrior presaged the album cover as a t-shirt design movement, which was an equal blessing and curse. A blessing as bands like Joy Division and the Ramones would always sell more t-shirts than records and a curse because it repurposed what had emerged as a new and distinct graphic art. With Milestones, it's all about the green shirt, a design element so powerful it overshadows the swagger that even Miles Davis. Legendary pinup designer Alberto Vargas, then 83 years old, came out of retirement to work on the Cars Candy O album, and it was a huge improvement on their cartoony debut album's cover. Mark Ryden's cover for Tyler the Creator's Wolf on the left juxtaposes the privacy of nature with an intrusive, all seeing eye and the majesty of the trees with their eventual commoditization as lumber, and a weird giant teddy bear. Anyone who doesn't like the cover for Ella and Lewis is a communist. Regular viewers would know I have a weakness for S. Neil Fujita's designs, as on the right, and here he cleverly incorporates his trademark blocks of colour into a piano motif. The Who were always a bit duff with album covers, but Who's Next in the centre succeeded in spite of some very heavy-handed symbolism. Oh yes, let's piss on an obvious monolith. And by the way, the 60s are over. Alienation, innocence and provocation. The burning man seeks intimacy through ritual but can never be close to his friend. The silhouetted lovers kissing in remoteness at dusk. An album that presents a naked ingenue with the question non-question, is this it?
Phil Evans and Jim Hall's undercurrent on the left is a photo called Wiki Watchy Spring, Florida by Tony Frisell. The compositing on Ricky Lee Jones is a little off, but the candid photo is sincere and ingenuous. And the Klaxon's cat is just a badass. The 50 Million Elvis Fans Can't Be Wrong album cover is surely one of the most famous ever. Elvis destroyed the pants of that gold lame nudie suit when he jumped off from the stage onto a cinder track at one of his very few gigs ever in Canada. Maiden Voyage is Blue Note at its best. Clean, dynamic, aspirational. To me, the Come Fly With Me cover is a central part of the defining iconography of the 1950s. The Parallel Lines album cover is so beautifully composed, but the real fun in it is the five guys in the background are all joking around and Debbie up front looks all strictly business. Taylor Swift's 1989 album is another highly successful step in the marketing of product Taylor. The washed out is it her, isn't it her juxtaposed against the sugar rush of music on the album. Compare and contrast Blue Train and the Centre with Taylor Swift's 1989 album. Both covers designed to further the public image of the artist, Swift the party girl relatable to suburban teens, Train the high-minded poet philosopher of jazz. A progression of modernist designs, 1951, 1960 and 1975 respectively. Command Records in the centre was a reliable supplier of interesting covers in the early 60s. We close on a beautifully designed album cover which, while it may not be the best, strictly speaking, is one of my very favourites. It is like Proust's Madeline, taking me back to the wonder of a nascent love of music in the summer of 1970. Wasn't that interesting? I certainly hope that you enjoyed today's presentation and that it piqued your curiosity and I would revel in your comments and suggestions left in the section below. Until we meet once again in good fellowship or until the nasty YouTube police shut the channel down, may you go forward in good health and may your bojambo forever be righteous.